facts, which are supposed to be justificatory um, pieces of evidence or claims or assertions that substantiate what is below the horizontal line here um, as the conclusion. So the conclusion of this deployment of the modus tollens argument says whether or not souls exist, so that's a metaphysical hypothesis, that there are these things we call souls in the world. But the conclusion here says that whether or not souls exist, they can't serve the epistemological function of allowing us to, in observational capacities, recognize that a person at one moment in time is the same as that individual that we encounter at a different location in time. It's asserting that we do that all the time. So if we were in a normal classroom, I see you on a Tuesday, you sit in the same spot on Thursday, I don't have to think about it. It's not difficult for me. I know immediately upon perceiving you, and this is what recognition entails, I know you are identical at this point in time, in this spatial location, to the very individual I observed in the same spatial location at a different temporal moment a few days prior. I do this without any difficulty, but if I was relying upon my observation of your immaterial soul, which owing to the fact that it's immaterial, it cannot strictly speaking be observed. If I was relying upon that observation to make the identity claim, it would be entirely mysterious how I'm even doing it. But it's not entirely mysterious. It's something that we do all the time without any difficulty, without really thinking about it, right? So for this reason, whether we want to metaphysically accept that there's something in the world called souls, it can't really serve the function that we're looking for here in terms of a principle of identity or of individuation for these reasons. Uh, so that concludes the first day. Now, the second day is where we get exposed uh, without more than once or twice calling attention to the philosopher in question's name to a very famous account of personal identity that is traced back to the 17th century British philosopher John Locke, according to whom personal identity, in the case of human persons, human beings, is something like memory. Um, but the second day opens up with an idea that has some resonance with Avicenna's floating man thought experiment, to which we'll be turning next week um, at the same time that we grapple with Descartes' view of personal identity as grounded in this immaterial substance or soul. But on the second day, Miller opens um, in this way. So consider the way you wake up in the morning. So surely, perhaps even before you open your eyes, you are able to discern that you are you, that you are the same person who went to bed at say 11 p.m. the previous evening and so forth. And you're able to make this recognition implicitly even before independently um, you know, considering it or thinking of what kind of body that you happen to possess at this moment. And if that's correct, then it seems that Professor Weyrob's criterion, which is a bodily criterion for personal identity, wouldn't be quite right either. Um, so she can know that she is Professor Gretchen Weira before even looking at her own body or seeing herself in a mirror. Um, so Miller wants to know, doesn't this show, and this goes back to Weyrab's conceivability point, doesn't this show that we can imagine waking up in a different body? Now the discussion turns to what the appropriate connection between these different stages in our life's trajectory or journey would be, um, allowing them to unite together to constitute a single enduring individual or person. Uh, and so here's where we get this idea, um, and the name isn't attached to it here, the name of the theory, but it's this idea that every, existing thing is composed not only of spatial parts, but also temporal parts, so temporal moments. So what constitutes me as a discrete individual is not just the bodily elements that constitute 
um, my objectivity as a material thing, but also the various pieces of time over my personal history that have contributed piece by piece to constructing the individual before you now. Um, and so I'm going to um, turn now to a little presentation I've put together of John Locke's famous theory, because that's what this person stages idea of personal identity has brought us into conversation about. So um, let's turn now to John Locke. So here is um, John Locke, and this is a quotation from his famous work from 1689, an essay concerning human understanding. So he says, and this is um, in order to define what a person is, and this has implications, you might note, for all sorts of political and ethical issues or questions that we might pose as well. But he says, we must remember what person stands for, what person means which I think is a thinking being that has reason and reflection and consider, can consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness, which is inseparable from thinking and seems to me essential to it. It being impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. So Locke's principle of personal identity turns out to be what is referred to as apperception. And so here is a simple way to define that phenomenon. To apperceive is, as a verb, to perceive that you are perceiving, or to be conscious that you are conscious, or to think that you are thinking, to feel that you are feeling. We could articulate the concept in all these various ways. And this is a special kind of self-consciousness or self-awareness that involves three elements. So thinking, time in which one is thinking, and most importantly, as a kind of medium or um, substance of linkage here, memory. Okay? But what is identity in general? So whether we're talking about the identity of a human, of a cricket, of a star, of a soda can, of a television program, of a baseball game. What is identity in general? Well, identity just means being one thing and not another. By, so an example, a blade of grass has an identity. It is this blade of grass and not that blade of grass, even if the blade standing next to the blade of grass in question is qualitatively identical to the one we're discussing in every perceivable respect. So a couple things to recognize here. An individual object cannot be in two places at once, and two distinct individuals cannot be in the same place at the same time. Now, what is the principle of individuation we've been talking about? So Locke is searching, as we are, for the principle of individuation, which I shortened to POI, i.e. the principle that makes something the same over time, despite other, perhaps su superficial changes. So consider a photograph of yourself as a toddler. You might think, that's a picture of me as a child. But why? What is it that makes you and the child in the photograph one in the same person? There are three distinctions that Locke makes in pursuing this inquiry. Substance, organism, and person. And each distinction implies a different POI or principle of individuation. So substance, this refers to the material stuff that makes up an object. So for example, the atoms, parts, or particles out of which it is made. Organism, this refers to a living body composed of parts organized in a certain way, a certain kind of structure. A person, lastly, 
as we were just talking about, so remember the quotation that I started these slides with, a person is a rational, reflective, thinking, self-aware thing. This is what we call the self. It is the me to which I refer when I say I or myself. Now, what is the POI of substance? Mass. So inanimate objects are substances only. They're not living organisms or persons. So the principle of individuation for an inanimate object is just the stuff out of which it is constituted. In other words, from a scientific point of view, it's mass. Thus, taking a look at the image of a rock here, if you have a rock and you chip off a tiny piece or a significant piece, strictly speaking, it's not the same rock. Even if you were to chip off a piece that's infinitesimal, that you can't even recognize visually, it's not, strictly speaking, the same rock because its mass has been altered. Now, what about the principle of individuation of organisms, that second category? For Locke, it's life. Note that living things such as plants and animals are both substances and organisms, but are not persons, which is reserved as a category for human beings. The thing that makes a living thing like such as an oak tree, for example, the same oak tree over time does not seem to be the matter that makes it up. The oak tree, remember, was at one point an acorn and then a tiny sapling, and it's continuously as it develops, losing old parts and gaining new ones, but it's the same tree. The same thing that seems to make the tree the same tree over time is the organization that composes life or life itself and not just the material stuff out of which it is made or to which it can be reduced. As long as it remains one continuous life, we say it is the same tree. So here's our real question. What is the POI of persons? Locke rejects the idea that the POI of persons is the same as the POI of material substances. Why? Clearly, if I lose a material part of my body, I nonetheless continue to be the same person. If you cut off my foot, I'm still the same person. I mean, my body has changed, and please don't cut off my foot, but my personal identity has not. He also rejects the idea that the POI of persons is the same as the POI of organisms. Why? Well, he gives us this thought experiment of a prince and a cobbler. So imagine that the memories or consciousness of a prince were one day transferred to the body of a cobbler. When the cobbler wakes up, he thinks he is the prince. He claims to be the prince, has all the memories of the prince. Meanwhile, the cobbler's consciousness goes into the prince's body. Now, Locke says most would conclude that the prince now inhabits the living body or organism of the cobbler and vice versa. And this entails that sameness of person does not require sameness of living organism. Some suggest, like Rene Descartes, that there is some non-material part of a human being and a person remains the same just as long as they retain that immaterial part. And this they call the soul. But Locke doesn't think that sameness of soul is what constitutes sameness of person either for two reasons. One, we can imagine the same consciousness being transferred to a different material object or soul. So think of the Princeton and Cobbler situation again, but now where the consciousness of the one is transferred not only to the other's body, but also to the other's soul. And on the other hand, we can imagine the same soul being shared by two persons. So imagine Socrates died and was reincarnated to a new body, and that later on, he gets reincarnated into you. So imagine further that you and Socrates share the same soul. Would this mean that you and Socrates were the same person? It doesn't seem so. You couldn't be held responsible for what he did in the past. And the ancient Socrates, it seems, couldn't plausibly anticipate experiencing life as you have lived it. And so this is the last thing I'll leave you with here. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in our Zoom session this week. 